I think a materialist approach to things is very, very consistent with uh, my experience in Christian social justice. I feel like the, more, the deeper I get into anarchist practice, the deeper my faith is getting at the same time. I would hope that you know, securing means of life for all would be something all people of faith would say, oh yes, that's at the basis of what we believe. And those who are most marginalized know the most about the truth, Thank because it's beautiful. To me, it's less that I think building class solidarity is a bad thing, as much as it seems like if you don't attend to things like anti-black racism, um, that's always going to get in the way of building class solidarity, actually. And when you go back, you find that a lot of uh, revolutionary grassroots participatory movements, the, the precursor. Welcome to, to the Magnificast, a podcast about Christianity and less politics. I'm a grassroots neighborhood organization. A lot of these were sponsored by the church. I'm Dean Dunlop. I'm a PhD student. What does it mean to say that institutional criticism is internally contradictory? Hey, so this week we have kind of a special episode. Um, so we've been doing the Damnificast, our weird side hustle on Patreon.com. Um, if you want to hear the Damnificast, you can hear the first episode a few weeks ago, or you can go subscribe to our Patreon uh, at patreon.com slash the Magnificast, and uh, you can listen to it there if you uh, give us a little bit of your money. He very kindly agreed to do an interview with us. Uh, we asked him some questions about the show in general um, and some some questions about, like, <laughs> I don't know, how the inside, the inside biz of Hollywood works. Uh, and it's all <laughs> really cool and interesting. Uh, Holly Weird, as we like to call it. Just kidding. We don't call it that. (laughs) Uh, But it's a great interview. Uh, You get a lot of interesting stuff about the show. So if you've been into Damnation, the show, if you've been listening to the Damnificast on Patreon, this is um, an episode you won't want to miss. What you're about to hear, however, is a sort of trimmed down version. If you want to hear the full interview, you can also go to our Patreon and listen to it there. So uh, what you'll hear is about 15 minutes of the interview here, um, and you can hear the full hour and 20 minutes or so on uh, Patreon. So check it out. This week on the show, we're talking to Tony Toast, the showrunner of the TV show Damnation that we're doing a podcast about on our Patreon right now called The Damnificast. Uh, It's great to have you here, Tony. On The Magnificast, we always ask writers to give an elevator pitch for their writing. We've never talked to a showrunner, so we'll see how this goes. (laughs) But we're going to ask you that same question. Um, What kind of elevator pitch would you give for the TV show Damnation? You know, if you're at a party and someone's like, what do you do? And you said, well, for a while I did the show, how would you, you explain it? And then also... How did you actually pitch it to the network? So I'm guessing those might be two slightly different uh, things. So uh, have at it. Okay, cool. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, two very different uh, responses. The elevator pitch, party pitch, uh, is I'll, I always usually say it's a Clint Eastwood Western in the world of John Steinbeck. Um, that's usually kind of the, the closest shorthand um, that's available. When, um, when pitching it to the network, actually, you know, an interesting thing, you know, the question of pitching it. Um, the first person in the industry I talked to about my idea for doing this show was my agent over breakfast. And I was telling her that I think I knew what my new show was going to, uh, my, my new project, the show I wanted to make was, and it was, um, you know, set in the 1930s, great depression. It's about farmers, labor issues. Maybe we could do it in black and white. And she, uh, she literally did a spit take, uh, um, on the breakfast table and, you know, told me like, that's, the least commercial pitch I've heard in my entire career. And, (laughs) uh, and so she's just like, you know, so like in the question, like, how do you pitch it? She's just, she, you know, tells me, you know, you can't pitch that. You know, you can't go into the room and say, you know, cause like there's a, uh, uh, pre-existing industry, uh, bias against period. Uh, there's, uh, um, an active lack of interest in uh, labor and class in the industry. And, uh, and then black and white's just a deal killer. So, um, <laughs> so, so, you know, like, uh, you know, kind of, kind of over three there from the start. So my pitch to, in the, um, in, to networks was to, uh, and, and to people in the industry was to write the first two episodes because I knew I couldn't lead with the time period. I couldn't lead with any political themes or with li- religious themes. I mean, maybe the one thing that is less interesting to the industry than um, class and labor would be religion. And, and so what I had to do is, you know, just 
just write the scripts so people could um, not think not think of it as period, not think of it thematically, but actually get excited about the characters, get excited about the uh, possibility of action, and to um, hopefully get a little bit excited about the idea of a show that operates and has the engine and the spirit of a Western, but is in a somewhat unfamiliar um, period and setting. So that is an opportunity maybe to uh, refresh or to um, revise some of um, the genre conventions. And so that's, so that's how I pitched it. I, I, I wrote those scripts, gave them to my agents uh, who um, we're surprised that it actually wasn't boring. You know, um, we're excited about it. They gave and and we roped in my manager, and we decided the best way to sell the show uh, is to kind of try to get give it some sizzle. Uh, so we we enlisted. Uh, I, I share a management company with a director named James Mangold, who did Logan and Walk the Line and Three Ten to Yuma, really great director and he liked the scripts uh enough to assign on to be uh the pilot director um he was originally going to be the pilot director and to be a producer so he helped me uh go around town and pitch it to networks and so that helped to have this very well respected um director um uh, by my side as as i made my pitch around town so long story short no pitch really um to the industry by itself, but we led with the script, led with the characters, and then uh, in discussions, allowed there to be maybe some surprising thematic elements uh, attached to the script that um, that maybe led more with violence and character and uh, genre than with um, any political elements. So as we've been talking about damnation with our friends and people who listen to our podcast, um, the thing that people say first is always that they're just surprised that it, it's a show on TV, that it made it, that it made it to TV, that it made it to Netflix. And, you know, not because like it's a bad show or something, but it's rare that you see a show that understands history and also um, labor and politics in this way. So once you, once you were pitching the show and you had the scripts and some other folks on board, were there any of like the big like political ideas that got pushed back on or was that, was it just kind of like picked up because it was an interesting story? That's a good question. Um, I mean, I'm still surprised that I was able to get it on the air and part of it was, you know, <sighs> So it was originally sold to AMC um, as a network, and it was in development there for about a year. And I think what they responded to was more the genre elements and the character elements. But um, at the same time, when we were shopping it, USA was interested in it. But at this, this was before Mr. Robot. And so one of the reasons we went with AMC was that we, we thought we had a better chance of being programmed there. And... Um, and then after AMC declined to um, to do the pilot, USA was still interested. And this was after Mr. Robot had come out. And and there's a um, particularly um, intelligent uh, network executive um, at USA by the name of Alex Sepial, who is really really smart, really, really and uh, and really really interested in exactly the um, political nature of the show. And actually, you know when they expressed interest of, of making the pilot and possibly doing the series, one of his requests was like, can you make it more political? Can you bring out more of this? Can you make some of this um, class elements, subtext, um, a little, you know, a little, bit, a little bit less subtextual and bring it actually a little bit more um, overt? And, and, and yeah, so that hit him as our main champion of the show within the institution of the network uh, the, and, and the success of Mr. Robots, which he had also championed prior and had pushed uh, some of the uh, sub politically subversive elements of that show. That gave us a kind of temporary cover within the institution of like, well, maybe this is this maybe this is what uh, people want to see. Maybe this is what uh, there's an appetite for. And so in that way, I think there was less resistance than you would think like. To a degree, like the word, like like Marxist and and Marx himself, like that, in in the in the process of the show, there would there would be 
pushback of like, do we do we have to hear, you know, the name Marx or do we have to hear them referred to as Marxists? Like, you know, things like that. Like, I'm not sure if how many people beyond Alex Sepial within the world of the network um, recognized, uh, you know, Seth Davenport's um, kind of paraphrase of Marx in in the first episode. I think that that successfully, um, um, you know, passed people by. It just seemed like a, um, you know, a, maybe a, a strange thing for a preacher to say, but they, you know, there wasn't the association to a, a specific figure for a lot of people. Even also, I think for a lot of reviewers, I think a lot, well, American reviewers outside of America, people um, keyed in on the, political historical element a lot more than uh, American critics did who, who didn't seem to pick that up that Seth and Amelia were, you know, essentially, um, Marxist communist, um, you know, entrenched in the, in the labor, um, I guess, rhetoric, uh, of the, of the times. And so, so anyway, so that's, th there was less pushback actually than, than you would think, but, but th that there was a thin line, you know, of finding what were the, what were the, almost words or elements that, um, that did get pushed back or did make people a little bit uncomfortable. But that, but it wasn't also only on the network side. As also myself as the writer, um, kind of you know the person behind it. I also I, I didn't want to lean too much into into that kind of language because you know i didn't want to only preach to the choir on the show yeah. you know i wanted i wanted i wanted people you know to you know you get home from work you know open a beer sit back after you know and and like oh cool they've got an actual kind of old-fashioned uh, a little bit of a western show and 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 not and like there's a certain there's a you know a certain dance there between wanting to be true to the period and my own intentions and the things I want to dramatize without telling people who maybe don't share my, some of my political leanings that this isn't for them. I, I want, I want them to give them um, um, you know, permission to, to be invested in the show without, you know, feeling like they're getting preached at or being sent. You know, I, I want it to be a little bit more gradual in a way where, you know, where people are, are invested and and don't feel like they're getting this isn't another Hollywood liberal telling them what to think you know like I I I, I kind of wanted it to be almost more subliminal. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me, um, and I think it works. Uh, just as I'm reflecting back, even on the pilot, uh, what you were saying about toning down some of the Marxism, but if you sort of have ears to hear it, then it can't really be denied is a really interesting strategy just for roping in uh, viewers, but also for telling a, a compelling story that's not uh, alienating. And I think that's probably the most fascinating thing to me about Damnation so far anyway, is uh, trying to balance all these things at once, telling a story that's true to the period, uh, telling a story that's also inflating and, and hyperbolically engaging some of the themes in the period in an interesting way. Um, and we'll get into some of the, the narrative pieces in a little bit, but maybe just to get off the, off the, um, you know, to get ourselves on the path anyway, what were some of these big aesthetic and political influences that are behind Damnation? You were talking about Marxism. Uh, were you reading a lot of Marx? Uh, you talked earlier about Clint Eastwood and John Steinbeck. Were you kind of, you know, thinking through the, these comparisons between genre and novels that take place in a kind of Dust Bowl era? You know, what, what's all going into that? What's the soup of Damnation? Yeah, I mean that's, I mean that that's like a two-hour answer, um, and because it is, you know, it's my first time to kind of, you know, get my my show, my creation on the air, and so you know you want to, you don't know how many swings at the bat you get, so you want to pour as much as you can into it. My interest in labor issues uh, come comes before almost my any political understanding, like so my. Um, I grew up very blue collar. My my parents were the day and night custodian in my elementary school, but they were also the president and secretary of their labor union. And so, you know, from you know my earliest memories, labor concerns were a primary lens upon the world and what it takes for you know blue collar people to try to make a living wage. That that just that's just a primary. 
uh, lens by which I see the world. And so like, that's always, that's always there. And then, you know, my, my educational path, you know, I went to a community college, then I went to a Christian college, then I did an MFA in poetry, but then I did um, a PhD in English at Duke, which is, you know, kind of Marxism central, you know, like I studied under Frederick Jameson um, and studied under, you know, a number of um, professors who identify as, you know, in a Marxist tradition of criticism. And so even though I, I wouldn't, call myself necessarily a Marxist um, because I, I don't think I, I, I don't have a strong enough intellectual grasp. So I'm, I'm, I'm more poet. I have more special feelings than intellect, I think, in terms of this. Like I, I'm a more of an associative um, uh, intelligence than an analytical one or a critical one. Uh, so like, but I, 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 as someone who loves genre storytelling, I often, um, get frustrated with how they, um, the genre conventions, um, seem disassociated, um, especially recently from real world, um, labor class realities in a way that I think like in the sixties and seventies and Peckinpah and Leone, there was, there was more of a, um, texture of real world politics and, uh, relationship between, you know, farmers and ranchers and, um, you know, railroad companies, like all that was baked into the Western and stuff. So like, so it is less kind of going in with a Marxist intention than trying to kind of reconcile my love of, um, of genre with my own kind of almost intuitive primal, um, feel for, for class. So, you know, I started off, you know, like I, I worked on these scripts, this idea for the show, like while I was working on another show called Longmire and, and which I worked on for five years and I loved and, but you know, I wanted to do my own thing. And so I just, I wanted to do something akin to a Western, but diff, but, but knowing that I didn't want to do it in the 19th century, I wanted to find, um, someplace to do it. And so I, I just, I, I read around in Studs Terkel's Hard Times, um, oral history of the 1930s and, and came across these farmer revolts and that kind of activated my imagination. So, I, you know, I was looking for a place where you could believably have cowboy Western type tropes. And then I found this specific situation in Iowa that had the kind of landscape and had a kind of almost hyper American iconography and mythos about it. And then reading into that situation, you know, I would have, would have had to have actively tried to avoid the political content that uh, resulted in this, these skirmishes that caught my imagination. And so, you know, it, it kind of, the research brought out some latent um, interest um, in me in this issue. So I didn't go in looking for a, um, a Marxist story. I came in looking for an interesting Western, and then the research suggested um, this class element and this religious element, which was also latent in, in my own upbringing, uh, brought those to the surface. So it was less intentional than a discovery almost in, in the material that I found. Yeah, that's a really helpful way to explain uh, your approach to the show. Well, um, so Dean and I have been watching through the show again, and uh, it's really clear to us that the writers and you have done your homework on putting the world of damnation together. Um, there's a lot of nuance in it that it just comes through. So it's a it's a great story. It's a great show. Um, what were some of like the books that you read or figures you got interested in who really inspired the setting and the characters? I mean, you just mentioned the Studs Terkel stuff about um, the farmers uh, strike. Um, but obviously like we're really interested in pastor Seth cause, uh, I guess he's our guy for this podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So was there anyone particular that prompted him or was he kind of like a, just a person that you fabricated or like, how did that work out? Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of a mix. So a little bit of the impulse, actually the, the show kind of started with the Creeley character, uh, in a way that, um, uh, so, you know, I don't if you guys want how many West, you know, how, how much of Western buffs you might be. So, you know, like 
there's John Ford's Manny Shot Liberty Balance, and um, Lee Marvin plays Liberty Balance, and you know he's the, you know he's just the brutal tough dude that uh, James Stewart and John Wayne have to uh, contend with in order to settle the West. And Lee Marvin plays kind of a variation on that character in um, uh, Bad Day at Black Rock, the John Sturgis film, and also in Bud Bedeker's Seven Men from Now. And and I, I love my idea originally was, okay, like let's start with, uh, if we take this Liberty Balance character and instead of him just wondering on like, what does he do when he's off screen? Like what made him like this? And like, that was the starting point. And so then it was like, okay, well then what character can I pair who would be a good match with him? And this kind of killer in a preacher's outfit, um, and that, that, you know, like that's a character that, uh, or an outlaw in a preacher's outfit. That's a character that Clint Eastwood, um, has played before in like pale rider and um, a little bit in Thunderbolt and Lightfoot. And so, you know, like I started off kind of playing around with almost those two cinematic um, figures or outlines. And then in my reading for Seth, um, Milo Reno um, in Iowa, who was uh, one of the uh, leaders of, of that Farmers Holiday Association movement, he became a um, a figure that I could use to color in some some nuance, some some shadings, some uh, and give some some depth. So you know, so that I'm not doing kind of just a you know cut and paste collage of cinematic reference points, and then kind of coming in from that. I remember at one point, you know, I'd being at a uh, a bar in Santa Fe, just finishing um, rapping for the day on Longmire and and take, you know being at the bar and thinking about Damnation and writing you know traits of Seth and Creeley and trying to make sure that they didn't have the same traits so that they could be an interesting opposition to each other and and like and then that was a process of discovering and filling in Seth's character and Creeley's character and then it was just populating their world with other interesting characters that could have some kind of contrast. And that would, you know, again, it's like more of an act of discovery than of intention of discovering who this character wants to be. I have very hippie creative ideas. Like I think that, um, you know, too much planning or too much intention can get in the way of creativity. So I try to like, I let, I try to have intention, get me half the way there. And then discovery, you know, I ha- almost have a leap of faith that, um, that the character is out there waiting for me to discover it. And so, so it, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of, of a, um, uh, there isn't a direct line between say one specific figure or one specific idea that, um, fed into these characters also like, just and then there's simply there's the fact of casting and of of tailoring um, uh, Seth to um, the actor Killian Scott's strengths to accentuate those um, kind of you know taking some ele- elements you know in the um, interrupt me if this is going too long um, but you know and we shot the pilot twice. And we, you know, we, we filmed the pilot, and then when we got picked up the series, we went, I, I rewrote some scenes and we reshot some scenes. And so the pilot, how it ended up, half of it was from the first shoot and half of it was from the second. If you remember in the, um, in, in the pilot, uh, Amelia goes to the newspaper office to kind of give some shit to DL Sullivan for not reporting that in the first iteration of the pilot, Seth did that. Uh, but in the, um, in the um, process of filming it and editing it and then rewriting, uh, I realized that actually that should be Amelia's scene and that actually um, Sarah uh, Jones, who plays Amelia and who has a lot of affinities with Amelia's politics, like that element of the story resonated, that it kind of almost intellectual element of, um, of their movement resonated more with Sarah and in her performance and she could more she could um, embrace that in a way and that Killian was more of a soulful performer. And, and so like there, there was some discovery even in the casting and the performance about um, 
which characters should carry what load and, and how to both address thematic concerns I had or um, interests that I had, but that could also create conditions in which the uh, actors and actresses could um, have the best chance of giving the best performance. Um, that's really fascinating what you were just saying about uh, following your nose, I guess, and letting the narrative drive it. I think that's also something that makes the show strong. It doesn't feel too didactic or too controlled. Uh, but nevertheless, there is a lot of really interesting rhetoric that comes out where, um, and, and maybe this is also part of the strength of Killian's performance too, the kind of soulful expression of the themes of Christianity and Marxism are able to be delivered in a way that, that feels believable and not just ham-fisted. Um, so yeah, that, that mashup sort of rhetoric is probably one of the most compelling parts to us. Um, like when Seth is quoting the theses on Feuerbach at church after giving this really crazy sermon, uh, or when he refers to the farmer's movement as God's body. Um, so just asking you as a writer, trying to think through, you know, the actor's ability to deliver certain things, uh, what you think the character should or shouldn't do. How does somebody sit down and write a sermon preached by, you know, a secret Marxist posing as a pastor? Uh, you know, what kind of rhetorical phrases in Seth's sermons are you maybe particularly proud of? Or, or what, what were you thinking of when putting those kinds of things together? Yeah, I mean, well, that's, you know, some of, some of it's just in the fog of just the, uh, of the process itself and just, you know, of trial and error and trying to, because yeah, like it, you don't want it to be a lecture and you want it like what I want wanted most is for, you know, the, the kind of unspoken backstory is Amelia and Seth had been trying to spread their message and because they, they came to people as organizers came to people um, with politics or labor as the interface that they were easily, um, I guess, marginalized or um, disregarded because for whatever reason, for many Americans, especially um, perhaps uh, my own rural tribe uh, is inherently distrustful of those particular interfaces. And so they, at some point, Amelia realized, you know, if we came to people as a preacher and a mo and a um, respectably modest preacher's wife, they might listen to us as long as what they think they're getting is the good word as passed down from generation to generation. And so what I'm wanting to do is to couch a pretty, a fairly simple political message, uh, you know, in, in, in essence, I had to kind of, you know, make it very direct, this idea of like, okay, like there's all these forces out to get you guys, farmers, and eventually workers, townspeople, and our only chance is for us to act collectively. Like that's the only shot we've got. And to, but to use, um, to find elements in scripture that can allow Seth and, uh, or Amelia through Seth, because Amelia is kind of the showrunner of the preacher Seth show, um, to, to convey that message in language that would be, um, that would not seem to East coast would not seem to highfalutin, but would seem, um, direct and, and would, and, and seem, you know, ultra American and not, you know, um, what Sacco and Vanzetti, you know, um, you know, you know, and some ethnic import from Europe. And so, and so, you know, so like the language of, you know, Jesus was an outlaw, you know, like of, of tapping into like the, you know, like that's why I was very, you know, uh, I was pretty happy when you guys were referencing the Woody Guthrie, um, ballad because, you know, it's the, it, in a way that's connecting Jesus to, you know, you know, obviously to Jesse James, who's such, you know, um, hyper American Midwest figure. And, and, and so like trying to, trying to use that, that language. So there's, you know, what, what am I proud of, of, of writing on, on that? It's actually, it's actually, there was a scene in the pilot that I ended up really butchering, um, for dramatic reasons. Uh, when Seth goes to visit, the uh, the Riley family after Sam has been killed, uh, it, 
in the final product, it's just he, he makes a weird reference to Martin Luther uh, and, you know, and he wants a revolution, but it's all pretty vague. Like that, that's like that's condensed radically from a much longer scene where he's telling uh, the Riley family about, you know, nailing up the theses on the wall and and this and that's, you know, a miracle is nothing less than a moment of God's attention. But Seth believes that it wasn't the words that Martin Luther um, uh, nailed to the wall that got God's attention. It was the hammer and the nails. And that's what got God's attention. And that it's, you know, because he's he's ultimately he's a he's a man of action. Amelia is a person of thoughts and words. And like there's some kind of synthesis of the two. But, you know, like you. You can't just have the words. You have to have the um, the hammer and the nails. And you know, like in in my mind, in the original script, that set up nicely the um, crucifixion of Sam Riley, in which I agree with you all. Like, like it's supposed to be a little disturbing, but doesn't quite resonate. Like I was never like we did it in the original pilot. We reshot it in the next um, uh, again, and it's probably not adequately dramatically set up in the right way but you know on the page um initially and this is part of discovery for me as you know like um what works and what doesn't work what works on the page doesn't necessarily work cinematically or uh, dramatically uh, there's a way in which that little mini sermon by seth inside the riley house uh was something of fusing uh, of him finding precedence in tradition um, and this is another thing I wanted Seth to do is to tell people like, you know, like in what I'm what I'm encouraging you to do. This isn't some newfangled idea. This isn't because I think I'm better than, you know, than your parents like this. There's a there's a strong, good Christian tradition for what I'm saying we should be doing. And so using, you know, um, Martin Luther as a as a president, using Jesus as a president in a way um even though, uh, you know, uh, using, you know, American outlaws as a president, like there, there is precedent for what I'm um, proposing here that we do. So don't feel like you're getting above your raising here. That, like, all that, like that, that was kind of, that was the feel that I was wanting to get both from, and in a way, Seth's trying to win over the farmers is almost a proxy for myself as showrunner trying to um, encourage people watching it to some degree to think about collective action is not some un-American, un-Christian thing, but actually like, no, you can actually, you can, you can construct a, um, a traditional common sense argument for this position. Um, um, that there's, there is precedent for that. So anyway, so like that, that's, you know, on one level, like that's what I'm thinking when I'm writing these Seth sermons. On another level, I'm just trying to make, you know, like what, how can I, you know, nobody or, you know, maybe other than you guys, nobody's going to tune in every week to hear a sermon. You know, so like I only, <laughs> I only, get, I only get a couple of shots at these and like, you know, there's not going to be a huge appetite at the network for, so, so I, you know, how, well, what, how can I, how can I make these succinct? And how can I give it some punch without it being too didactic, but without, but with it having some kind of dramatic um, import to where Seth is at that point of the story, all, all of this, like, so that's, you know, like it's, it's a, um, it's a volley of concerns. It's easy to kind of, you know, cause you're trying to be true to your intentions, but you're also trying not to lose the audience. You're trying to play to the um, performer strengths. Like we talked about trying to keep the enthusiasm of the network and the studios that they will actually promote the show, you know, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, um, so yeah, so that's some of the stuff that's going through my mind when I'm working on those, um, those sermons. <laughs> that's a great explanation. I also, uh, I appreciate the, uh, uh, giving us the inside peek to the deleted scenes, uh, with regard to the, the Martin Luther stuff. That's great. <laughs> that makes the, that does make the end of the first episode, uh, make a little more sense for me. So I like that. Um, yeah. uh, every time, you know, I, I went back to re, you know, rewatch a couple of episodes and like every time, like in my mind that like reveal of Sam was going to be so powerful and so disturbing. And each time it's kind of like, ah, oh, that's yeah. Like, like I almost said like, Oh, that's kind of a weird move. Seth. um, <laughs> 
you know, like, you know, it, you, you got to take some swings. <laughs> it's all right. It was a good swing. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, something we always come back to you on the show is the ambiguousness of like Seth's faith. We talked about him and, you know, kind of jokingly, he's like a, a secret Marxist in pastor's clothing or whatever. But j- just in the, just in the example you, you just gave too, when he's quoting Martin Luther and he knows scripture, it's not like he's, you know, completely clueless either. So, um, you know, he's there as a pastor, but like definitely not in the tr- traditional sense. He's, he's using, um, he's using a, a tradition that he kind of forms from Bible, the Bible, like from Christian history um, and, trying to uh, explain a pretty simple idea about collective action. And that's cool, but there's a certain sense in which he actually grows into the role, like a little bit more than he does at the beginning. Um, And he takes on some of those like pastoral duties, or at least he acts in kind of a Christian way sometimes. So do you want to say anything about that dynamic of his, his actual faith and his secret Marxism? Yeah. I mean, that was actually kind of one of my favorite things about on that character is that idea of, you know, a character, it starts out as a total sham and, and him gradually coming to believe in what starts out as a, as a ruse. And, and that, you know, like not, not to get too, well, I mean, you know, so, you know, part of it is like, you know, I've always been moved, interested in like, say Pascal talking about like, you know, if you have a crisis of faith, like just go through the actions of praying and then the faith will come through that. And, you know, this kind of, you know, existentialist that, you know, existence precedes essence like that. If, if, if you go, you do the motions of, of, of a faith or of a belief that, that, you know, that almost ritualistic act will, will come in. You're preparing the ground for actual faith and belief even if it's not what was originally there at the outset. Like I find that moving. And I find also like, you know, part of my intention was this uh, almost in the, um, the theology cosmology of the world of damnation of that, this idea that God or belief comes to people, um, through, um, through forgery, through outcasts, through the non, um, non-sanctioned, like that, 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 that is a, um, almost a preferred path of revelation or something, you know, like it, it, it I, I'm hesitant to kind of use that cause that's overselling what I think the first season actually accomplished. And, um, and that's something that I was hoping to kind of see, leave room to build towards if we were able to do subsequent seasons you know, and then of this also becoming, you know, in season two where, where Seth goes from, you know, I'm an instrument of the revolution or of revelation to like, I am the revolution. I am revelation. I am an instrument of God and, um, and his own kind of fucked up, um, conception of, of God because of his own trauma of his growing up and his own, um, unique relationship to violence. Like all of that was, in the intention, but, but this idea of him, you know, by the end of the season, he does think of himself as a preacher, you know, like it's never made explicit, like him and Amelia's marriage. It was, it's also in 201, they're pretending to be married. They're not actually by legal rights, you know, no, there's no, you know, Seth Turner, Amelia, um, Hopkins marriage certificate. But by the end of the season, he fully feels that he's a, preacher with a relationship to God and that he has a marriage. And so this idea of what started out as a forgery or as a fake came to have some authenticity by the end of season one, like that was an intentional story, an intentional arc, like in terms of how we parceled out different developments of the season for Seth in particular and his relationship to Amelia, that's something that um, I quite enjoyed. And, 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 you know, in the um, almost, fog of creative battle that, you know, like, I think we still fought to keep room for that story because like once you get into the guts of a season and you get into the guts of say a network's anxiety, like, are people going to watch this? Like, we're not sure if they are, we should have more killing. Um, and, and so that, um, 
trying to still keep the nuggets of of some of those thematic stories that you want to explore through the season can be a, a challenge. But that that was definitely um, I'm glad that you guys were you know asked about that because that's something that um, I enjoyed writing and and seeing Killian perform um, for Seth. Uh, there's so many questions that I want to ask you based on everything that you just said because <laughs> now I'm curious about how so many of these other characters uh, develop too. Um, yeah, I'm going to take us off our uh, our scripted questions just for one minute because you keep bringing up uh, Amelia, who I think is probably one of the strongest characters in the show, at least the one that. So I haven't finished it yet. Um, I'm watching it as we're talking it through, uh, but she's the one that I'm the most invested in, I guess, in in many ways. Uh, and I love that she's you know as Seth is doing all these really kind of big public um, things, these, these big shows of of political. Uh, resistance or power or, or whatever there's a kind of pageantry to him um amelia is the one sitting back there writing like pamphlets and uh you know talking to the journalists and trying to build the seeds of like a you know the architecture of something that's sustainable um and maybe you could just talk to a little bit about her and uh i mean we we keep speculating <laughs> uh, amongst ourselves whether or not the seth and amelia are like members of the communist party usa whether they're members of like the iww you know there's so many kind of layers of background and i'm curious as to you know what are the the um the the past of amelia and the the roles that she's growing into as the show develops yeah so i mean the uh, amelia was probably well, first of all I'm, I'm glad to hear about that um response to to amelia and i think a lot of that um is i think due to sarah jones's performance who i think really um really resonated with that role and really embraced it and really kind of you know it it spoke to her. And so like on, on just a certain level, if you have a, a performer who's gifted and who responds to a character, but who particularly responds to, you know, what she responded to Amelia was her ability to pursue, actively pursue a, um, um, what, uh, uh, Sarah would, I think believe is a, a righteous agenda in an era, in a situation in which um, the social structure uh, gives all these barriers for um, a woman to be active, especially in a rural in Iowa. I mean, there's, you know, I mean, there's famous, you know, there's Mother Jones and there's uh, Mother Ella Bloor, I think I'm remembering her name as a, as a, as a Marxist um, uh, kind of provocateur uh, in Iowa um, shortly after, you know, would be kind of coming into town in season two or season three. Uh, but anyway, so part of it is catering. Okay. Like Sarah's excited about this. She does this part really well. Let's do this. And, and another element was, you know, like Amelia's role was not fully formed. Like she was the last of the main characters to really kind of take their final shape in the conception of the show. And, and I think it wasn't until I realized that Amelia should be, Amelia, in a sense, essence, I think I referred to her earlier, like she's the showrunner of the show because like she can't get up. She feels that she can't get up there in front of the congregation. And so Seth, she's cast Seth in this role. And she's in essence is is the secret writer um, behind all this is not the public face. And that and then that's that's her um, that's her role. And she's going to try to find a way to um, to guide Seth um to publicly, you know, be this figure. And, and so like that, that once that happened, then, then the character crystallized and she had life, uh, her backstory is, you know, she comes from money that she, it, there's a later episode, I think episode nine, where she, she, um, she tells a DL a little bit of her origin story, but, and, but it's, it's, you know, I think she is a little bit more pure in that, you know, in essence, like her father, um, owns um owns some textile factories when she was a teenager she, she she was friends and worked with the workers there they tried to unionize and her father called in strike breakers and they you know just brutalized her friends and this and this sent her down a path of uh, being being radicalized and so like you know like the you know the um party membership and stuff like that i have to confess like i don't know like i i have like that's that's part of, you know, both Seth's, um, 
denomination. Like, I, I, you know, early in the show, you know, he says, you know, pick one. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to him because it doesn't matter to me. Like, I'm, I'm kind of, um, for better or worse, a little bit of like a, a poet at heart in that I, I kind of cobble together from different sources into something that makes sense to me. So like there's may, you know, like I, I have trouble keeping fidelity to any particular doctrine, whether it's political or theological, like, cause I, I my mind works in a more associative, um, kind of restless way. And so to me, like Seth's theology is, um, a little bit like mine, which is like, you know, a mixture of some passages from, um, you know, the King James Bible, maybe some William Blake and Emily Dickinson poems and some great gospel songs. Like that's, that's, um, that's the canon in, in maybe his imagination. And so like, that's, that's a little bit what's at work there. And, and almost in the same way, politically, like, like to me, like getting into the weeds, um, creatively and create, like, to me, like the diminishing returns and, and, and having too much of a party affiliation for these characters. Like to me, it was miracle enough to get their message on there. And, and to me, like I had to have a hard time other than, you know, um, for a handful of viewers, uh, maintaining, um, interest in, um, in getting into too much of the details of party affiliation. Well, f- fair enough. We'll just have to write our own uh, communist damnation fanfic. I think. No, yeah, no, <laughs> no, yeah. Instead of instead of romantic escapades, it's just <laughs> the the minutes of their uh, of their poli- <laughs> political uh, backroom uh, uh, decision making is uh, yeah no totally. yeah yeah I re- I really want like the you know um, I really want to see like the boring arguments where Seth is having about like Browderism and whether or not that's cool in the CPUSA <laughs> uh, arguments about like the common turn you know that's the stuff that really really gets my creative juice going. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <that's... laughs> well, maybe I'll steer us back on track here uh for a quick okay. second so um amelia is the 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 pastor seth showrunner i like that a lot um with amelia too you have kind of like this um you know she's kind of trying to grow into like a certain you know understanding of herself politically and she um copes with some of like what it means to be a woman in a revolutionary mindset or something by writing you know these pamphlets that are with a with a male pen name and that's interesting thing too but um uh, so so the show parses out some of some big ideas with gender when it comes to amelia but also with bestie the other character that's on maybe the other side of the um the other side of the dynamic of the show so um yeah seth and amelia on one side but then creely and bessie on the other who also has her own sort of like fake it till you make it kind of moments with creely um, but it's, uh, with, with Bessie, we have this other part of the show, uh, where we, you know, it's, a, it's about gender, but also about race in some pretty interesting ways. Um, Bessie yeah. is a, a super complex character, um, with a lot of interesting turns just in the first two episodes. Um, but, uh, there's also this other, other end too, where you have like, um, you know, an active white supremacist kind of element to the show who are, you know, very clearly the, the bad guys, the black legion. Um, so can you say a little bit about, um, um, Bessie and race and, um, maybe even the black legion? Like why was it important to, cl- uh, include all of this in like a, you know, this period drama? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think part of it is just, you know, trying not to, well, so like, you know, episode three, um, starts with a like one of my favorite little bits of the show, which you know, you have this all American um, white family playing baseball out in the field. And, you know, if this is an American dream, I don't know what it is. And, and the wife goes to get some cream sodas and you've got the black Legion robes and nooses there inside that shed. Um, and like the idea behind that is, you know, um, kind of this time period, like those two things go hand in hand, this pastoral, almost Norman Rockwell ideal that I think a lot of Americans idealize and this idea of going back to uh, trying to suggest or dramatize the idea that that pastoral ideal for those who experience it, like it was very violently maintained and policed um, and, and was, um, uh, constructed at the, um, at the cost of, um, many, many people. And so that's, 
that's part of the idea of, of trying to, you know, like part of the reason that I got interested in this particular place in this particular time is that these, you know, farmers kind of, you know, this is like a, a, the same iconography of field of dreams of this kind of, you know, better or worse, most, I guess maybe from like this, this traditionalist agrarian ideal of, of America and of this kind of innocence and trying to complicate that in some ways was part of the, the notion of this, of the show in. And so like, and then, you know, the black Legion is, you know, they're just, well, you know, they're real and they're weird and they're scary. And, and that, you know, like they, you know, Malcolm X wrote in his autobiography that he, you know, like is his belief is understanding that black Legion killed his father. You know, like that was, something you know of returning to detroit and that was you know something in a future season i would have loved to get in, of of connecting like this of, of, of telling the secret history of the formation of modern america i wanted to get as many of these primal elements into the story as i could while keeping it dramatically compelling and so the black legion and, and just dramatically the idea that you know, they're behind these masks. And so you don't know if the grocer that you see um, is, is it could be a member of the Black Legion or could not. You know, like there's this this masking and unmasking element that's inherently dramatic um, that I found interesting. In terms of Bessie, you know, like well, Bessie and Creeley's dynamic, that that might have been my favorite thing to write about the show. Um, yeah, you know, kind of similar to like, you know, we have, like you mentioned this, like, you know, this, the fake it until you make it, you know, I was intrigued almost on a philosophical level uh, of this idea of uh, Bessie and Creeley as essentially soulmates, but that they, that they come soulmates meeting each other through a transactional relationship of a prostitute and a John. And, and so if that under those terms and those conditions, is how you meet your soulmate. What does that mean for that relationship? And and that's why there's in these early episodes this insistence um, that I wanted to have of them maintaining the facade of this is still a business transaction. This is still business. Like because if if I admit to there's just something more somehow like I'm I'm not worthy of any kind of human relationship other than a transactional one that I pay for. And like yeah, I, I don't want to get too too much saying like, well, this is a reflection of life and late capitalism in which you know every relationship is commodified and monetized but there's a little bit of that there but that's that that's kind of a little bit that that was kind of the germ of that relationship and then and then it, you know like you know in in writing the scripts you know like i'm just, you know like i start this creedly character and it's like okay like what well, he kills this guy you know, well, what's he going to do now if he's going to stay around town? Like, well, maybe he's going to shack up at the brothel, you know, uh, cause that's, you know, like I, I, I wear some influences on my sleeve. Like I like Deadwood is like Deadwood and the Sopranos. Like that's, that's 99% of television history to me, like those two shows. And it's so like, I, I want to write a brothel um, thing. And then like, okay, well then what would be an interesting um, character to pair Creeley with? And then for whatever reason, like, well, it's been, you know, it's Iowa. Um, what if there was a black prostitute in the middle of Iowa when like, you know, Iowa has like, you know, probably a less than 2% um, black population. So like um, you don't expect to see a, um, a black woman here. And then, you know, clearly being illiterate was kind of there from the get go uh, to give him a little bit of vulnerability since he's, you know, He's such a um, force, um, you know, in the traditional kind of masculine um, gunplay world. So, like, we have to – I want to give him some kind of vulnerability. And so, you know, especially for the time period, uh, it's almost a more feminine element of, of, you know, the world of letters or of literacy. And so, well, it would be interesting to pair to, – to even out the power dynamic that he's, you know, a woman like Bessie who is – socially marked, um, um, marginalized publicly because one, she's a woman, two, she's African-American, three, she's a sex worker. But if in private, there's almost a um, um, power equality 
between the two simply because of the fact of her uh, literacy and her de degree of intelligence, then I'm kind of interested in that dynamic and how they navigate that. And so like, it, 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 it's, it's all, it, it starts from a place of um, trying to keep my interest dramatically. And then I kind of let the thematic cards fall as they may in terms of race and gender from there, because I don't, you know, like I, I, I'm not interested in, in, in the, in sending any kind of, I don't, I don't have any particular insight about race and gender. Uh, my, I think my duty is to dramatize, like not let prejudices against race, gender, political people to keep me as a dramatist, from giving characters unlike myself a full inner life and um, agency and uh, believable motivations, and so like to me like that's that's the extent. Also politically, even though you know like of trying to you know not even if people have beliefs other than mine, not to let that get in the way of their humanity. So like I I, I don't know if I if I had any real. Like I, I just wanted to dramatize interesting tensions, and and some of those tension lines fall along gender, fall along race. You know, I was very interested for the three main characters in the show uh, that are women: Amelia, Bessie, and Connie. Like to take this idea: okay, this is the 1930s, and there's very circumscribed um, expectations and roles for women. Um, not to say that there isn't now, but I think is particularly potent then how do these very um, interesting um, women um, cope with that? And how do they, in fact, try to find a way of turning that to their advantage? You know, Connie plays up feminine, you know, uh, is teaching, you know, she takes Brittany as her charge and teaches her how, you know, if you act ladylike and, and um, give people an agreeable semblance of the order they expect, you can kind of buy yourself, you know, if you if you come to people and give them the appearances they want, that buys you room to to do the shit you you, you need to get done. And so that's a little bit of Connie's ethos. And I think you know um, Amelia's is to use different guises to mask the the gender uh, uh, behind the words and the thoughts that are finding traction. And and I think you know for for Bessie, it's it's more uh, is how you know how does she cope with being you know how her degree of intelligence and and i think decency you know it, the fate has put her or, or societal conditions has put her in this marginalized position like how does she reclaim for herself some agency and some um some kind of life um when there's so many um uh, obstacles in her way like the, 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 that's all that um that went into the uh, the the female characters of trying to give them dramatically interesting uh, situations less than some kind of specific racial or um, gendered message. Yeah, trying to build these different kinds of characters, uh, especially when you might disagree with them, is a really fascinating uh, way to think of this show, um, because you do also do a good job of writing some of the villains, right? Which is what you need to do if you want to have a compelling narrative. Like, people have to be somewhat um, sympathetic just to get interested. Thanks so much for hanging out with us, Tony, and uh, good luck on all the all the irons you've got in the fire. Thanks for listening to this very special crossover episode of Damnificast and Magnificast, whichever one you heard is up to you, I guess. Uh, if you like what you heard, uh, you can support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash The Magnificast. You can also follow us on Twitter at The Magnificast. Um, hey, quick uh, quick announcement I guess I should tell you guys about. Uh, we're on Spotify now, and that's pretty cool, and we're also on YouTube. So um, get all those weird uh, YouTube-targeted ads. Uh, confuse the algorithm by listening to our podcast on their platform. It'll be a really weird experience for everybody. Uh, cool. The intro music is by Amaria Armstrong, and the outro music is by The Illogical Spoon. See you next week. I don't want to get up for church in the morning, church in the morning, souls alive. Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church We'll meet down by the riverside There we'll swim with all creation Never get tired, never bored Don't worry, someday There'll be no damn between us and our Lord